All right, this is factors affecting voter behavior. A lot of this stuff we kind of learned last class, but there's a couple new bits of information. All right, so geography plays a role in voter behavior. Uh, we'll start with the South. When I talk about the South, I'm talking about Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Maryland, Missouri, Arkansas, those states... Uh, I would say from Abraham Lincoln in 1860 until Lyndon Johnson in about 1960, those states were traditionally Democratic. Uh, that's because Lincoln was a Republican. Or the Republican Party was the, the Civil Rights Anti-Slave Party. Uh, maybe I'm assuming here, but I, I feel like the South changed to being a little more uh, Republican today as the civil rights movement uh, took hold and the Democratic Party like JFK and LBJ started passing all those uh, civil rights laws. And so they turned against that party and they've been Republican ever since the 1960s. The Great Plains, that's like Nebraska, uh, Kansas, those kind of states, those uh, typically tend to be Republican. The Rocky Mountain region, so Colorado, that area tends to be Republican, although it's a little, I don't know. I mean, we did our map. You know that it's it's been sometimes going blue in some of the elections. Uh, we know New England, and if you look at the Electoral College map you made, used to be Republican, but increasingly it's been Democratic in recent years. The Great Lakes region, like Ohio, Minnesota, uh, Miss, uh, Michigan, that uh, is mostly Democratic, but they they can switch sides. So they're especially Ohio is what we call a swing state. That means that it's not consistent, and it changes from election to election. And then the far west, California, Oregon, Washington, tends to be Democratic. Democrat. Okay, a little vocab here. Um, when you have a really strong presidential candidate that people are really excited about, there is this vocab word called the coattail effect. And Barack Obama benef benefited from this in 2008. Everybody got really excited about his election. And what it did was it swept in a whole bunch of Democrat people in the House of Reps and Democrat people in the Senate. And so we see that sometimes in elections where people are really excited about the president, in that same year, it drives so many people to the polls that they also vote for people in the Senate and the House of Reps that match the party of the president that was just elected. So that's called the coattail effect. It's like they're riding on his coattails, if you're familiar with that phrase. Okay, down here under uh, time, you have different types of elections. Um, you have maintaining elections where things mostly are the same, like states voted the way you expected them to vote. You have deviating elections where there's a temporary change, but people return back to their old ways. But then look at the letter C, it's bold, and those are critical or realigning elections. And a realigning election is where people vote a different way than they did before, and they keep voting that way, maybe for the rest of their life. The one that stands out to me is, well, I guess there's two on there on that list, but in 1860, uh, Abraham Lincoln was elected, and that definitely changed the way that people voted um, afterwards. But the one that is really easy to remember for me is 1932. In all of the 1920s, we had um, Republican presidents, and the 20s economies were really prosperous, but the presidents were really laissez-faire, hands-off. Uh, then we had the Great Depression come in 1929, and a lot of people blamed the Republican Party. And then Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran for election in 1932, and a ton of people switched to the Democrat uh, side, and a lot of them stayed that way. I mean, you know that Franklin Roosevelt was elected a total of four different times, so uh, he had a really lasting impact on the way that people voted. Okay, the, another one on here is midterm elections. A midterm election is whenever 
um, the president, it's not a year where the president is elected, but it's a year where the House of Reps and some of the senators, uh, what, 33% of the senators are elected. So an example would be Obama was elected in 2008, so that was not a midterm election, but 2010 was two years later. Obama was elected in 2012, so that was not a midterm election. But 2014, two years later, that was a midterm election. And one thing that we see very frequently is that the midterms tend to favor the opposite party of the president. So the party in power usually loses seats in the Congress. So let's flash back to 2008. Everyone's really excited about Obama. He's a Democrat. He wins the White House. You have all these Democrats win in the House. You have all these Democrats win in the Senate. They're riding on his coattails, the coattail effect. Um, but then he's in power for two years. He does Obamacare. It's um, A lot of people criticize him. It's really common for a president to come in, and then no matter who he is, they're going to be criticized for a couple years. And then the, rea- the result will be in the midterm election. So in 2010, there's a big switch, and a whole bunch of the opposite party is voted in. So this is not just a phenomenon with Obama. This is something that happens with a lot of prior presidents. And that is, uh, just know that in midterm elections, the party in power tends to lose seats in the Congress. In every, look at that, every midterm election, except for two times in about 80 years. Okay, so this is just saying that people have, uh, people can be qualified under a political party identification by a seven-point scale, strong Democrat, weak Democrat, independent-leaning Democrat, pure independent, independent independent-leaning Republican, weak Republican, strong Republican, and this is probably, uh, I think it's actually a a test question, what's the greatest indicator about how someone will vote? And it seems like almost too easy, but the answer is, it's whatever party that they're registered with. So uh, the way that someone's registered is the strongest indicator of how they're going to vote. However, many people probably vote quote unquote, they vote the man, not the party. So uh, people want to look at who's running for president and they are going to make a judgment, even if it means maybe changing parties. Um, Letter C says straight ticket voting. Straight ticket voting is whenever you vote the for like, let's say you're going in to vote for Republicans and you vote for Republicans all up and down. So for the president, for the governor, for the California State Senate, for the National Senate, for the House of Reps, you're voting for Republican all the way down. This is called straight ticket voting. And sometimes the ballots make that really easy by actually having it uh, it divided by parties. And then kind of uh, a term you hear a little more often is split ticket voting, which is maybe you vote for a Democrat for president, but you like your senator who's a Republican, and so you're going to vote for him again. So this is called split ticket voting. And this is... This is more facilitated by the the only ballot I've seen, which is an office column. So it's not separated by, like one side Democrat, one side Republicans. It's just office by office. And you vote, who do you want for governor? And there's a list of like four choices. Independents in this country, these are people that are not registered Democrat, not registered Republican. They register independent because they don't want to be affiliated with a party. We have seen an uh, increase in the number of independents in this country and a decrease in Democrats and Republicans. So about one out of three people in this country is an independent. And I've said it in class before, but these are the people you want to uh, earn their vote if you're running for president. Some of these independents lean a certain way, like they lean Republican or they lean Democrat. Some of them are pure independents with no clear pattern. I guess that's just 12% of people in the country. Many of these independents tend to be young, college-educated, with above-average incomes. We talked about this in class. Actually, I think the next few slides we might have talked about. Gender can play a role in how someone's going to vote. So a male is more likely to vote for a Republican. A female is more likely to vote for a Democrat. Uh, Look down there in bold. The idea that a female is more likely to vote for a Democrat, that's called the gender gap. The gender gap. We learned this in class too. If you don't need to uh, write it down because you already know it, that's fine. But white people are more likely to vote for Republicans. Non-whites are more likely to vote for Democrats. And blacks are the most loyal Democrat voters. Social class plays a role. You already know this. Um, 
the lower income is more likely to vote for Democrat. The upper, the richer people are more likely to vote for Republican. We already know this slide about religion, that uh, Protestants, a.k.a. Christians, are more likely to vote Republican. Catholics are more likely to vote Democrat, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Another factor that influences how people vote is, is issues that year during the election. So, uh, for instance, if we're in a recession. So in 2008, President Bush was at the end of his term. Uh, and really, to be honest, the country was having some major financial problems. We were entering into a terrible recession. And so the recession was the number one issue. You can talk all you want about Iraq and Afghanistan. But the recession was the number one issue, and so people were mostly voting with that issue in mind when they voted between Obama and McCain. And they do this sometimes with retrospective voting, which is looking back on whether or not things have gotten better or worse since the last election. And with Bush being a Republican and McCain being a Republican, a lot of people associated the two together, and they looked for somebody new. So if you're, if you're a president and you're having an unsuccessful time, that's going to hurt your, your party's chance at getting elected again. Um, and then there's prospective voting, which is looking at the candidates' views on issues and how they will accordingly handle the office if they are elected. And then lastly, but not least, of course, is the candidate appeal. So just personality. How much do you like the candidate as a person? Uh, people like Obama benefited from this. He had great appeal among the people. JFK had great appeal among the people. Ronald Reagan had great appeal and charisma among the people. So that definitely plays a role. Uh, whereas like Al Gore against Bush, Al Gore came across as robotic and kind of dull. Um, maybe you are thinking the same thing right now with, uh, if you look at the candidates that are running on the Republican side and you can kind of figure out who has more charisma and who maybe lacks that charisma. This last slide, I know I showed to one of the classes uh, already. I didn't show it to uh, fifth period, but it's just fun facts about that 2000 election where Florida basically was tied between Gore and Bush. Uh, so it's not exactly relevant to this PowerPoint, but I did just stick it on the end there. So period five, you can look at that. It's kind of funny. Uh, that's it. The lecture is done. Go ahead and answer the questions on Schoology. Peace.